So our first speaker uh, is Dr. Akhil Palaniswamy. And uh, many have asked among the myriad of diets, which one is for me? Uh, Palaniswamy uh, answers this question in his book, The Paleo-Vedic Diet, a complete program to burn fat, increase energy, and reverse disease. In his book, Dr. Palaniswamy blends the best of the modern scientific method with the time-honored ancient healing systems, Ayurveda. His approach helps to understand a person's biochemical individuality and develops a diet and lifestyle plan that is individual for each person. He also discusses the importance of nutrition, intermittent fasting, exercise, sound sleep, a balance of mind, body, spirit, connectiveness, and the role of toxins and detoxification. He's a physician who practices integrative medicine, blending his conventional medical expertise with evidence-based holistic approaches, including functional medicine and Ayurveda. He is also the head of the integrative uh, medicine program at S UCSF. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, having me come and, and talk with you tonight, and thanks to all of you for uh, for coming out uh, coming out this evening. So I'm going to talk about my approach to health, which I call the Paleo-Vedic diet. And that basically combines two words, Paleo and Vedic. So Paleo refers to the Paleolithic era, so what our ancestors ate, early human diets. And Vedic comes from Ayurvedic medicine, which is the traditional medicine from India. So um, I'm very interested in hearing your questions at, you know, at the end of the presentation, and uh, um, so we'd like to make this interactive as much as possible. So the first concept that I want to talk about is this idea of evolutionary mismatch, which is that um, every, literally every single thing we do from the time we wake up until the time we go to bed is completely different from how we evolved to live as human beings. And our modern world is thus you know, completely different from the world we evolved in and actually our genes are uh, adapted to you know, function optimally. So let's go to evolutionary biology. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Daniel Lieberman, who is an evolutionary biologist from Harvard. And um, he's a big uh, researcher in evolutionary mismatch. And his idea is that most of our modern chronic diseases, like obesity, diabetes, you know, heart disease, uh, dementia, and even things like um, foot problems, back pain, can be traced to this concept of evolutionary mismatch. And if you look at the timeline for human history, for more than two million years, about three million years, our ancestors lived as hunter-gatherers primarily. And it's only in the last 10,000 years, which is really um, like a blink of an eye in, in human history, that agriculture, farming um, has developed. And uh, within the last few hundred years, our food supply has changed uh, dramatically uh, as well. But evolution occurs very slowly. So our genes are just trying to catch up with all of this rapid change. Because for you know, those almost 3 million years and 100,000 generations, we lived as hunter-gatherers. And that's really what we're adapted to. And in the last 400 generations or 10,000 years, we're starting to um, ad adapt slowly to the you know, agrarian and farming uh, advances. So what did our ancestors eat for millions of years? Well, when you hear the word paleo in the media, uh, typically people think of meat. And you know, when I tell people I wrote a book about paleo, they say, oh, you mean the meat diet. Uh, well, no, that's not what I mean. Um, because our ancestors really ate uh, plant foods primarily. And these were wild plants, um, very high in fiber, you know, low in sugar, uh, leaves, roots, fruits, nuts, uh, legumes as well. And they've studied about 230 um, hunter-gatherer societies. And um, there was not one of them that was um, found to be vegetarian, interestingly. Um, they did eat meat and fish whenever it was available. Um, that was what was um, generally consumed by these hunter-gatherers. Now also, there's a common misconception that paleo has to be low carb. But actually, starchy plants have been consumed for hundreds of thousands of years, even before agriculture. And most of the research uh, looking at the composition of carbs in the diet, you know, traditionally, comes out to about um, 30 to 40 percent uh, carbs from di uh, from um, calories from carbs. And so pa the paleo approach was never really a low carb diet. It was a moderate carbohydrate diet, and um, 
some Paleolithic societies actually ate upwards of 70 or 80 percent calories from carbs and were extremely healthy. So we'll come back to this, uh, this concept. And also, a lot of um, paleo authors have excluded legumes and uh, saying that you know, um, beans and legumes have anti-nutrients and that they were never um, really consumed um, before. But actually, the anthropological evidence is that a lot of different uh, Paleolithic societies did have legumes of different types. And the way they would overcome that issue with the anti-nutrients was soaking them, fermenting them, you know, sprouting them. And generally, that does inactivate most of these anti-nutrients, like the phytates, tannins, and lectins, and makes those legumes much more digestible. So um, I think that legumes have been unfairly excluded from the Paleolithic uh, approach. And a lot of people, therefore, cut them out unnecessarily. And that was part of my thinking with the Paleovedic uh, diet. So when it came to, to meat, um, typically, these populations ate uh, with what's called nose to tail. So they would eat the entire animal, you know, not just uh, muscle meats like is popular uh, today, but a lot of organ meats, especially those were the most highly prized parts of, of the animal and um, literally the entire uh, animal, all the different tissues. And they were slightly higher in terms of protein intake and lower in, in carbs compared to the modern diet. But that doesn't mean it was a low carb diet. You know, that's the uh, important point to make here. And part of the reason for my approach, uh, for my writing the Paleo-Vedic diet was to say that paleo should be a plant-based diet, you know, ultimately. And the majority of food being fruits and vegetables, which are our primary defense against disease. And even if one is, you know, having meat or, and, and fish, that's still the foundation. So that's what I think paleo should be, you know, ultimately. Now, if you look at how fiber intake has evolved um, over the years, most of our ancestors evolved and our digestive systems evolved with between 100 to 150 grams of fiber uh, per day. So that's um, really you know, much higher than most of us are, are eating. And if you look at uh, agrarian societies, they still had a relatively higher intake of about 35 grams of fiber per day. Whereas the modern diet for most Americans are getting you know, about 15 grams or less of fiber per day. And um, this has had a huge impact on our microbiome, you know, the, the good bacteria in our, in our gut, as well as, uh, as other things. Now, another key difference with the um, hunter-gatherer societies was that they consumed many different plants. And um, every day would typically have about 20 different species of um, you know, fruits and vegetables. And in a year, would have between 100 and 120 different types of uh, plant foods. And so the uh, problem today is that most people end up eating the same thing every day, you know, because we're all busy and it's, it's convenient. And um, you know, if you like the food and it's healthy, isn't there um, you know, no problem with that? Well, actually, the phytochemicals that you're uh, missing by getting a, a very narrow diet, you know, that's a big issue because the more diversity of plants you eat, the more diversity of the phytochemicals and the fiber and all the important nutrients in plants and vegetables. So just trying to eat things that you don't normally do in terms of you know, fruits and vegetables and uh, legumes, that in itself is a valuable exercise for, for diet. So I think that paleo is an excellent starting point in terms of cutting back on the refined grains, the vegetable oils, trans fats, but it's important to know that it, it must be customized, and that's where we'll come to Ayurveda to help customize it for your un unique body type. And I've seen in my clinic that sometimes people actually may be doing themselves harm uh, on paleo, eating um, much lower carb than is optimal for them, or not adapting their diet to changing life circumstances, or following a diet that's not ideal for their Ayurvedic body type, which we will talk about. So for example, um, raw food is great for certain body types and actually not recommended for other body types. So it really depends on your unique um, you know, constitution. So I want to talk about this um, um, hunt, one of the few hunter-gatherer populations that's still um, around. And these are the Chimane from South America. And recently, uh, there was a study published this year which found that 
their prevalence of heart disease is 80% lower than that of ours in, in the United States. And it's not just an issue of, um, you know, these people don't live as long, so they, they don't get heart disease. And that was, you know, kind of said before. But man, some of them, even in their, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s, have had these CT scans of their hearts and uh, completely clear arteries, no signs of heart disease. And um, it's definitely, there is high infant mortality there, but those who reach adulthood, you know, have the um, incredibly low rates of heart disease. And their lifestyle is, um, is highly active. So the men from this population average about 17,000 steps uh, per day on average. And the women are also equally active doing other tasks. They're getting about 15,000 steps on a typical day. And so their diet, when analyzed, actually is um, quite high in carbs. It's 72% um, calories from carbohydrates. But there's no uh, modern processed foods. You know, there's no flour. There's no, um, you know, kind of our junk food. It's unprocessed complex carbs. They have a lot of brown rice, plantain, um, other roots, corn, nuts, and fruits. And they do hunt and catch fish and meat to supplement the diet. But it's very much um, a whole unprocessed diet that's high in carbohydrates and starches. And uh, this study was published just in um, April and in The Lancet. And so the, the Chimane actually have the lowest reported levels of heart disease of any population that's been recorded uh, to date. And uh, so that's just one example of um, you know, the, the sort of um, health outcomes that these traditional populations are capable of. And it's, it's not age related. And I think that if we can ad adapt some of the principles that they're living by, you know, we can really improve our own outcomes. We can't go back and you know, hunt for our food or you know, live this lifestyle. But there's a lot of lessons we can take from, from these uh, truths to implement in our own lives. Now, before I go on, I want um, you guys to help me solve a mystery. And that is the, among, that among our young people in certain parts of the world, uh, myopia, or needing glasses, is um, totally epidemic. It's um, just skyrocketing. And this is within the last uh, just 70 years or so. The rates of myopia, these are um, four Asian countries, have gone from about 20% to about 80%, literally, in um, you know, the last uh, about 70, 80 years. And um, you might think that you know, just needing glasses, maybe that's quite benign, but actually it carries increased risk of glaucoma, cataracts, and retinal detachment. So it's not a completely harmless condition. So why is this um, happening? You know, are there um, any theories out there as to why? Yes, please just shout it out. Uh, lack of vitamin D, especially at certain developmental stages. Okay, great, great, great point. Lack of vitamin D, computers, okay, yes. Vitamin A and looking at things short instead of this. Okay, yes, okay. Last one, yes. Lack of medical knowledge about how to change people's vision back to what normally is. Well, that's, a, that's a great perspective, yeah. So uh, the comment was about lack of medical knowledge to change vision back to, you know, to what it should be. So, um, so researchers have actually studied all of these things and it's actually um, none of these. So it's not related to how much, uh, you know, your parents might have told you, you know, don't sit too close to the television, you're gonna ruin your eyes. Uh, not true, actually. You can sit as close to the TV as you want. Um, it's not related to number of hours of reading or, you know, spending time on a screen or looking at a computer or, um, you know, how much uh, are you, is the child on a, you know, iPad or a smartphone. So scientists, researchers have studied all of these things, and there's, but there's one factor that conclusively has been shown to be the factor that's responsible for this, and you were close to it. It's actually sunlight. So how much time outdoors does a child spend? And this isn't time outdoors um, you know, playing sports or being physically active. It's just time outside when they're exposed to sunlight. And the way this works is that uh, they found that there's a circadian rhythm in the, in the retina, which is, um, leads to dopamine produced in the retina. And sunlight is required for the stimulation of this cycle and the production of dopamine. And this cycle, when it's disrupted, affects the growth of the eye. 
So myopia basically results when the eyeball grows improperly. So when children aren't getting enough time outdoors, then literally that, that's the reason why their, um, their eyes don't grow properly and they end up needing glasses. So when they've looked at countries where um, children you know, spend a lot more time outside, the rates of myopia are very, very low. And um, this has led to, uh, this is from the, uh, Singapore, where they, the government has created this uh, program for kids, you know, just reminding them, you know, keep myopia away, go outdoors and play. And um, it's, uh, it's a, it seems like a very simple concept, but this is, again, going back to that uh, idea of evolutionary mismatch. You know, we evolved outside, and our children evolved outside, getting sunlight. And um, vitamin D is, you know, one part of it, for sure. It's, uh, it's a factor, but the, really the, the main factor is the dopamine production from the circadian rhythm that sunlight triggers. But, vitamin, but other benefits of sunlight, of course, vitamin D uh, regulates our sleep. And so people who have sleep issues, if they're able to get outside and get sunlight during the day, that's been shown to help them with better sleep at night. Um, sunlight also has been shown to stimulate immune cells. So we had a very interesting discussion about the hyperthermia and you know, raising the body temperature. But sunlight also has been shown to improve and uh, speed up the movement of the T cells in the body. And uh, um, so there's just so many benefits we're finding out about sunlight, and it's a, it's a very basic thing, but it just highlights the importance of living the way that we evolved to live. So among these three on this slide, which would you guess is the best predictor of early death? So show of hands, how many people think it's obesity? Okay, a few. How many people think uh, physical inactivity? Okay, more. And loneliness? Okay, yeah, it's actually loneliness. So um, they're actually close because these are all pretty big factors, as you can guess. But loneliness is a slightly better predictor of early death than being obese or uh, being completely inactive. And I, you know, that also goes back to how we evolved because we evolved in these um, small, multi-aged you know, groups with uh, maybe 20 or 30 people. And they've looked at modern societies called blue zones, which have very high longevity. And all of those societies, they eat completely different diets. Um, they you know, live in completely different parts of the world, but they all really prioritize social connection and often spend a few hours every single day in quality time with friends and family and neighbors. Um, and the, the loneliness uh, rates are at their highest level uh, that they've ever been worldwide. And technology, of course, is an you know, important thing to talk about. And it's made us more wired than ever, but I think it is a factor in, in the rise of loneliness. And you might think, well, is it really a big deal to talk about technology? Because, uh, you know, 100 years ago, we, we were just waiting for our horse-drawn carriage while uh, reading our newspaper, and now we're waiting for our Uber while reading our smartphone, right? It's really not that different. Well, actually, um, I, I really like this quote, which says that, you know, as communication has gone global, the means by which we connect to people, even those within walking distance or right next to us, are making a digital migration. So conversation is changing and sometimes going away for good. So I think that with technology, it's possible to use it in a positive way, you know, to gain connection. And, um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that there's a, um, it's really a double-edged sword and we have to be careful how we, um, how we utilize it. So now we're going to come back to focus on living the way that we evolved to live. And that ultimately at the center is a healthy diet, which we're going to talk about. And being very um, physically active, movement is important, the social connection we talked about, getting adequate rest and sleep, and managing your stress effectively. So my approach specifically, which I call the Paleovedic approach, the center of that is a customized nutrient-dense paleo diet. So we're going to talk about this idea of nutrient density in a lot more detail. And we customize it using your Ayurvedic body type and strongly emphasize spices, and we'll talk about why. Incorporate daily routines, fasting, uh, stress reduction, and uh, strongly emphasize detoxification. 
so both uh, daily regular detoxification through food and also periodic more intensive detoxification. So when we're talking about nutrient density, um, with micronutrients, there's two main kinds, the vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals. And so in order to get more dietary um, nutrients, you, you want to choose the most nutrient-dense fruits and vegetables. And we'll talk about how to do that. And you want to incorporate spices as well. So, um, so this goes back to the whole uh, evolution and evolutionary mismatch concept because our modern fruits and vegetables are completely different from what our ancestors used to eat. You know, our modern apples are smaller, or all our modern, modern um, sorry, our modern apples are bigger, but all of the modern um, foods are, are quite different. And um, the wild plants are more fibrous, less attractive, you know, less sweet. And that unfortunately does not sell. So um, farmers over the, you know, hundreds of years have bred our plant foods, our fruits and vegetables to be um, this way. But as a result of that, they have lost a lot of the important phytochemicals. So scientists are now studying about uh, 30 to 40,000 different phytochemicals. And these are some of our, the primary defense against disease. You know, that's why plants um, really protect us. So there was an interesting study which compared wild apples to modern apples. So there on the um, left you, are some wild apples from Nepal, which are actually present in other parts of Asia. And on the right is the ginger gold apple, which is one of the top 10 selling apple varieties in the US today. And I, I'm sure you know that the wild apple has more phytochemicals than the modern apple. But what percent difference is that in terms of um, nutrients? You know, one ounce of wild apple versus one ounce of modern apple today. Just uh, shout out a number, anybody. 400%. 400, 300, no higher than 300? 10,000? 10,000. 10,000? It's higher than that? Yeah. <laughs> so. 40,000. 40,000, close. It's 47,500%. Uh, uh, so what that means, that's the difference of uh, 475 times. So, um, it's, um, so it's like we're comparing apples and oranges. You know, it's like not even uh, comparing apples to apples because uh, these um, wild apples were just, even just one ounce, you know, compared to one ounce of a modern apple, it was just so rich in uh, phytochemicals and antioxidants. and. So, you know, we can't obviously go back to eating wild apples, but we'll talk about how to maximize your phytochemical intake and choose more wild-like, um, you know, vegetables and fruits. So a simple tip is just to get the mo most uh, deeply and intensely colored fruits and vegetables. That's the whole idea with eating the rainbow, because all of these bright colors are each coming from a different phytochemical. And so getting as much of those different colors in your diet, that's, that's a great way to do it. Also, most of a plant's antioxidants are part of its defense mechanisms. So that's how a plant um, protects itself, is with these phytochemicals that are you know, noxious to pests or um, predators or, or whatever. So they're in the skin and usually just below the surface. So if you look at the avocado, you, you know, you've all noticed the, um, the layer of flesh that's right next to the skin. You, know, you see it's like brighter, more intense green. So that is the part of the avocado that actually is the most uh, nutrient dense. So whenever you're eating an avocado, be sure to uh, scrape the skin clean and uh, you know, get all that uh, nutrient dense flesh right below the surface. It actually applies to most uh, um, fruits as well. Apples, um, you know, potatoes. The skin is really the, the source of most of the antioxidants. And so you definitely want to eat the skin as, whenever possible with you know, all plants. So with lettuce, um, the, um, so people know which type of lettuce this is pictured here? Romaine. Romaine. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the number one lettuce consumed in the US today is iceberg lettuce, which is 90% um, you know, water and very low in um, phytochemicals. Um, it has some fiber, but romaine lettuce is a great option because it's, it has four times as many phytochemicals as iceberg lettuce. So just choosing a simple substitution for your salad you know, with romaine lettuce uh, would greatly increase the phytonutrients. Yes? Is the heart of a romaine lettuce much different than iceberg lettuce? That's a great question. Um, 
I don't think it is as, as different because the, it's really more in the, yeah, the question was um, about the heart of romaine lettuce versus iceberg. And it's, um, I think it is slightly more nutritious, but the, um, most of the a plant's um, antioxidants are produced in the area where it's exposed to sunlight. So same with uh, lettuce, it's all, it's in the leaves. And as you get closer to the center, there's much less. So that's a good question. Now, other alternatives to iceberg lettuce. So um, arugula is um, excellent. That peppery kind of uh, tone, a uh, taste that you, you get from it, it reflects uh, pretty high levels of some beneficial phytochemicals. Um, radicchio is also a, a really good option. And loose leaf lettuce of any type, green loose leaf lettuce or red loose leaf lettuce, also is far superior to iceberg lettuce. So these are some simple ways you can get more phytochemicals you know, with your leafy greens. And leafy greens in general are one of the most important categories of uh, vegetables we should all be eating. So um, cabbage is actually the number one vegetable that's um, consumed worldwide, uh, you know, gr green cabbage. And, um, but a simple way to get um, six times as many phytochemicals as green cabbage is by getting red cabbage. And um, you know, you c cabbage works great for making sauerkraut uh, because of the um, fermented foods have a great benefit for your microbiome. So if you do that with red cabbage, you're even getting additional benefits. Um, and this is a simple way to um, just get you know, more phytochemicals out of your daily fruits and vegetables. So this was a picture I took at my local farmer's market. And um, cauliflower is an exception to the color rule because even the white cauliflower is very nutritious and uh, very high in cancer-fighting compounds and you know, other nutrients. So white cauliflower is extremely ext nutritious, but purple cauliflower has even uh, three times as many phytonutrients as uh, white cauliflower. So if you can incorporate as, as many different of um, brightly colored cauliflower, you know, um, they have now um, orange and green. Uh, all of those are actually quite uh, nutrient dense. So when looking, we're talking about onions. Um, and on this slide, there's um, four different types of onions. So which kind would, would you think is the most rich in nutrients of these four types? Red, red, red. red onions. You might think they were red onions, but it's actually not. The blossoms. The blossoms, no. Scallions. Scallions, yes. So uh, scallions are actually how wild onions used to be. They, if you look at the, um, the roots, that's the, they used to be very small. And um, so, but they're incredibly, even though they're very plain and don't look like much, scallions have um, 125 times as many phytochemicals as a white onion. So uh, incredibly rich, they're very close to you know, wild onions. And the, the green um, shoots have most of the antioxidants like, uh, you know, in other plants. So incorporating scallions in, you know, all in your cooking is a great way to really boost that phytochemical intake. And of course, red onions have more nutrients than white onions, but um, still not close to what scallions have. And leeks are great prebiotics. So they're great in terms of the microbiome. So there's other reasons to eat all of these, uh, these types of onions, but scallions are the most uh, nutrient dense. What about quercetin? Quercetin levels? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, I'm actually not sure of the answer to that, but I know that uh, most onions, uh, I think red and, and spring onions probably have comparable levels, yeah. Okay, now we'll talk briefly about tomatoes. So um, on this slide, which is the best source of uh, lycopene, which is one of the main antioxidants from tomatoes? Sure. Cherry tomatoes, uh, close. Yeah, cherry tomatoes are better than the big, large tomatoes, but. Roll nut tomatoes? No, not that great, really. The canned one, yes. So the, um, the canned one, yeah, and. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 that's true, that's true. Yeah, no, there's an issue with, uh, of course, um, um, canned food in terms of the BPA in the lining, for sure. I, that, uh, the point of this slide, though, is just that certain vegetables are better for you cooked and certain vegetables are better for you raw. So with tomatoes, actually cooking them really uh, boosts the lycopene content in two ways. It changes the lycopene structure from a cis to trans molecule, which is much better absorbed. And also it breaks down the cell walls in um, uh, tomato that make it a little bit harder to absorb. 
So you absorb a lot more of the lycopene when it's cooked and made into a sauce or um, you know, tomato paste. And um, so if you incorporate tomato sauce, yes, get it in a glass jar, but uh, it's, it's much um, more concentrated in terms of lycopene. And um, the small cherry and grape tomatoes are, of course, more nutrient dense than the large tomatoes. But um, you know, cooking tomatoes really uh, improves their, uh, your absorption of the nutrients in tomatoes. OK, so that was just a taste of the discussion about you know, wild plants. So in my book, I have a whole chapter. I go through every type of fruit, every type of vegetable, you know, how to shop. But those are just some basic tips you can take to get more nutrients out of the um, plants that you're eating every day. Yes? I've got one question on avocados. Yes. Uh, since you say most of the nutrients are in the standard virus, you're making a blender drink, which you throw the whole avocado in, seed, wheat, and skin. Well, um, has anybody tried that? I, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I need to yeah. see. But oh, I yeah. It's from the skin. So the, the question was with avocados, because the skin is the most um, nutrient dense, would you throw that in in a smoothie? And uh, I don't think you'd need to. Um, I think um, mainly for taste reasons. I, I don't think it would taste very good. But um, there are other thing, things that, for example, uh, lemons and limes, those are, the skin is very nutritious. And you can you know, grate the skin and use it in you know, smoothies or other things. Um, even onions, the skin is very rich. So you can cook with, use, use the onion skin for cooking. With avocados, yeah, I think as long as you're eating, I think the seed is fine and definitely just all of the flesh, but I wouldn't use the, the, the skin. Mango skin is poisonous. Which skin? Mango skin. Mango skin? It's poisonous? Oh. It's like, um, sorry, it's like a frozen oak. Uh, frozen oak can be in a Oh, okay, yeah, for certain people, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, um, you know, mangoes are very, um, actually very rich in nutrients. So even just having the flesh of mangoes gets you a lot of, you know, vitamins and phytochemicals. So um, don't need to eat the skin, yes. You're not afraid about the sugar? The sugar content of mangoes? mangoes. Well, they are, they are, I mean, they do have more sugar, but um, they're, it's, it's blended with fiber and, you know, other um, phytochemicals and nutrients. So I think that, um, you know, in moderation, they're very healthy. And uh, um, sugar that's in a, in a fruit is much less harmful than sugar that's, you know, processed and refined. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to shift gears and then talk about the second part of the Paleo-Vedic approach, which is the Ayurvedic uh, medicine. And um, just curious, how many people have some familiarity with Ayurvedic medicine here? Okay. Oh, great. OK, so we have a very uh, uh, knowledgeable audience. So I first want to present a few cases of um, patients that I've treated in my practice using Ayurveda. And we'll come back to these. So the case number one is a um, nurse who works at my local hospital who was struggling. She was on a paleo diet already, but struggling with low energy. Uh, constipation, fatigue, and not able to exercise. And her thyroid was uh, considered borderline. So her TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, was 3.7. And um, it's still normal, but certain endocrinologists would consider that to be suboptimal because it's higher than what is really you know, optimal. And then her free T4, um, which is one of the thyroid hormones, was um, low normal. And she had elevated thyroid peroxidase antibody, or TPO, indicating um, Hashimoto's disease, which is an autoimmune thyroid uh, disease. And her T3, which is the active thyroid hormone, was actually low. So she went to her physician, and she was told that her thyroid was you know, borderline. And uh, to just wait a few years, it would get worse. And then he could prescribe her medication. So to just come back in a few years when she feels worse. And then at that point, she would uh, qualify for a prescription, because right now she doesn't technically qualify. And uh, you know she didn't like that too much. So <laughs> she, um, she came to me for a, a natural approach. So we'll come back to her. Um, the second person I saw was a 32-year-old um, software engineer. And he had ulcerative colitis, which is inflammation in the colon. And he was having. Uh, very severe problems with um, blood and mucus in the stool, diarrhea, 
Now, he had been paleo for about a year, um, avoiding grains and legumes. And his diet consisted of um, eggs, meat, vegetables, dairy, and fruit. It was quite restricted. But he was still having elevated CRP, or C-reactive protein, which is a blood marker that measures inflammation. And he was already on one medication, the mesalamine, but he didn't want to start the second one, which is called Remicade. That is a, um, a biologic, which is a, an infusion that's given to suppress the immune system. And it does help with you know, autoimmune disease, but it's a very powerful medication with side effects and, and risks. Um, now, before seeing me, he had taken out gluten from his diet, and that had improved his symptoms by 20%, but he was still very symptomatic and um, wanted to have a, a dietary solution. So, so we'll come back to him. And then finally, this was a 46-year-old um, woman um, who had three children, a uh, very busy working mom, and she had been dealing with migraines. They were having, uh, happening every single month for three years, but they weren't menstrual migraines or you know, food-related. There was no clear trigger. Um, she also was having um, constipation with you know, hard bowel movement every four or five days. She was told to hydrate better, and so she was drinking you know, lots of iced water every day, having salads every day, and she was taking a medication known as Miralax, which is um, medication for constipation, um, a laxative, basically. So just keep those in mind. We'll come back to those three cases. I'll give you a little bit of background about Ayurveda first. So the word Ayurveda comes from Sanskrit, Ayu meaning life, and uh, Veda meaning science. So it's the science of life, literally. And it's the oldest system of medicine dating back at least 3,000 years and really emphasizes um, nutrition as illustrated by this quote, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use, but when diet is right, medicine is of no need. So the philosophy of Ayurveda is based on the um, five elements concept of the universe, and we'll talk about that more. And it really emphasizes the body's self-healing ability. Ayurveda is um, qualitative science, so um, it's highly scientific, but focuses a lot on, the, on qualities rather than quantifying things, like in Western medicine, and believes that each person is unique and that diet and you know, lifestyle needs to be tailored to each person, the environment, the season, the time of year, a um, lot of different factors. So those five elements are space, air, fire, water, and earth, and they combine to form these three um, doshas, which are forces in the body that are principles that lead to all functions of the body. So um, the three doshas govern um, actually all the functions of the body and mind, and every person is born with a unique combination of those three doshas, the vata, pitta, and kapha, and that's what determines the body type. And it's a balance between these doshas and the you know, body, mind, and spirit that leads to health, and it's an imbalance that leads to disease. And doshas have um, you know, positive connotations as well. So when you're in balance, each person has a different strength and a different natural talent, natural ability. But when you're out of balance, each person gets imbalanced in a different way, you know, physically and emotionally. So that's where Ayurveda can provide a lot of insight about that process. So we'll start with vata. So vata, or uh, wind, is the energy that governs movement. So remember we talked about um, qualities. And so the qualities of vata are the qualities of wind, literally. Light, cold, dry, and mobile. And vata, so it's associated uh, in a positive way with creativity and you know, rapid um, thinking, learning rapidly but in a negative form is also is, uh, associated with fear and anxiety and uh, restlessness. And um, in terms of physical symptoms, is associated in, a, in, with, uh, in imbalances with dry skin, um, losing weight, um, you know, feeling cold all the time, having constipation, which is a dry digestion. So it's all those qualities of wind that can get either you know, in balance or um, out of balance. And the second dosha is pitta, which is fire. 
And this is the um, heat energy of metabolism, so it regulates digestion, absorption of nutrients, uh, regulation of temperature. And pitta has all the qualities of fire as well, so it's very hot and sharp and intense. And it's linked with your agni, which is digestive fire, as well as um, associated with you know, insight, intelligence. Um, when it's out of balance, can it lead to anger and irritability? So that's the other side of pitta. And finally, we have kapha. So kapha is the force that provides structure. You can think of it like earth. So it's heavy, cool, slow, and damp. And um, you know the um, kapha force provides strength. So it's associated with all the structural elements, like our bones, joints, ligaments, etc. And um, there's positive and negative, um, uh, you know, emotional connotations for kapha as well, like illustrated here. So now one th the key thing to remember is that the goal is not to attain um, um, one third of each. So you're not trying to get like 33% vata, 33% pitta, 33% kapha. You're actually trying to get back to your um, original level. So everyone is born with a different proportion. So let's say you were born with um, um, say 50% vata and 30% um, pitta and 20% kapha. So your goal is actually to reestablish that balance and uh, not to get a, a third of, of each, but to return to your own original level. So everybody has a different target or a different goal that they're working towards. And the imbalance in doshas results from um, you know, genes, of course, diet is a big factor, lifestyle, stress, um, isolation, and uh, toxins in our environment now as well. And every disease as well is individualized. So five people with asthma, if they went to an Ayurvedic doctor, would get uh, five different treatments. So it's not like there's one treatment for diabetes or one treatment for um, you know, heart disease. It's very individualized to the doshas that are involved in each person. So to illustrate, let me come back to those cases of the patients I saw in my clinic and talk about how uh, I worked with them using Ayurveda. So, this was our um, nurse with fatigue and constipation who had the borderline low thyroid and did not want to take you know, thyroid um, medication or uh, didn't want to wait until she got worse. So in her case, she had an excess of um, kapha or earth. And so I had her um, begin a kapha reducing diet. And the, um, we focused on increasing the agni because uh, um, Often the low thyroid, you know, the thyroid is the driver of metabolism in the body. And in Ayurveda, it's very linked to the agni, which is the driver of digestion. And so we talked about how to strengthen her digestion. Um, I started her on this herb ashwagandha, which is great for excess kapha and very good for the thyroid. And after three months, her, uh, her T3, which is her thyroid hormone, improved um, by 40% from 2.2 to 3.0. And her TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, um, remember it was, um, I think, 4.2. It fell below 3. And so that would be considered um, you know, optimal in terms of uh, endocrinologist's view of her labs. And she also lost weight and felt like she had energy to exercise. And that led to a positive spiral of you know, being more physically active and losing weight and getting more energy. Um, and she. To this date, it's been um, three years. She's been doing well and not having uh, you know, any need for thyroid hormone. And I feel like she'll probably be uh, fine as long as she sticks with um, you know, an Ayurvedic regimen. And uh, I should just clarify that in terms of determining your body type, I have a questionnaire in my book, which is a few pages that has um, questions that you can answer to figure out your patterns and your, you know, your habits and physical and mental characteristics. And that's how I usually uh, encourage people to get an idea about your own body type. So the second case was the software engineer with ulcerative colitis. So you remember he had the um, bleeding in the stool and he was on medication and still on a paleo diet but not getting better. So um, what would you guys say if you had to guess which dosha was pitta. out of balance? Pitta. pitta, yeah, exactly. So he had very high pitta. And in his case, his diet, so 
the eggs, the dairy, the meat, um, everything that he was eating actually had a very uh, hot quality. And while that's okay for some people, for him it was actually um, probably making his symptoms worse. And so I had him eliminate all of those foods, even though they're you know, paleo and really very healthy foods, and switch to um, much more of an almost vegetarian diet with you know, bitter greens, um, a lot of steamed vegetables, cooling foods, just uh, some fish and seafood, which is more cooling than meat, and um, incorporating turmeric into his diet. And he noticed that after three months, he was able to reduce the bowel movements in half, and the inflammation had, was coming down, so he was no longer having bleeding, um, no longer having the mucus in the stool. And uh, it took about a year of working together, but eventually he was able to um, get off of his medication and um, just remain diet controlled with the ulcerative colitis. Um, we did a lot of work on his microbiome, of course, because um, ulcerative colitis is a, um, hugely influenced by the microbiome, but the dietary factors really made a big difference in, uh, in his case. And then finally, we have the, um, the mother of three who had um, chronic migraine and constipation and was um, drinking lots of iced water. So which dosha is involved in her case? Vata. Vata, yeah, exactly. So, um, so vata is the, the main um, dosha where um, raw food is not considered beneficial. Um, and if you are having raw food, you want to always balance it with um, um, you know, spices or oil. And, but in, in a patient who has excess vata, they actually recommend avoid eliminating raw food for a period of time. And also the iced water and um, cold foods were really exacerbating the high vata and making her worse, making her constipation worse. So I had her switch to a vata pacifying <coughs> diet with warming foods, you know, eaten hot, and um, incorporate <clears throat> a lot more fat into her diet as well. Um, such as avocado, olive oil, ghee, and sesame oil. And just with those dietary changes, she found that um, her constipation had resolved. And um, within a few months, she was able to go off her medication, the Miralax, and reduce her migraine frequency quite a bit um, as well. So um, that goes back to the concept of the, you know, that raw food is good for certain body types, like pitta and kapha, but not so good for vata body types. So there's a yeah, questionnaire that I, um, that I have that helps you figure out your body type. And then I, I make recommendations which include this ancestral and evolutionary perspective that we've been talking about this evening. Um, talks about you know, how much um, animal protein you should have, um, whether you should have raw food, you know, how much, et cetera. <laughs> and then also, Ayurveda really believes in prevention, but the, the key thing is that every person is um, prone to different types of illness based on their you know, genes and their body type. And so Ayurveda individualizes the recommendations for prevention. And I think that's one of the great strengths of Ayurveda is understanding what you're you know, prone to or how you're prone to getting out of balance and figuring out the most uh, you know, customized way to remain in balance and prevent that from, uh, from occurring. So that's the, the discussion about um, Ayurveda. I want to talk briefly about the uh, detoxification piece, which is another um, important element of the Paleovedic approach. And um, so with detoxification, there's, um, of course, lots of you know, different ways we can do that. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the infrared sauna, and uh, you know, sweating is a great way to de detoxify. You, um, the, the sweating that, um, the detoxification that occurs when your body is heated from an external source, like a sauna, is different from exercise. So the sweating from exercise is beneficial, but it um, works in a different way and is not as effective for detoxification as external heat of the body. So there's one food which I um, recommend for a lot of people that is uh, great in terms of daily um, support of detoxification. and those are the beet greens. So this is a picture I took at my local supermarket, and it's the, um, the leafy tops of the beetroot. So those are actually much richer in antioxidants than the root itself, 
Um, the root, root, root is also good too, but the greens are especially powerful. They're a rich source of trimethylglycine, or TMG, which supports um, something known as methylation. And that's an important process in the body that's happening like a million times every second and uh, affects the detoxification and also mood, digestion, a lot of different pathways. Um, there's several, there's actually three anti-inflammatory nutrients that are not found in any other food, only found in, in beets, and they, those are listed there. The, there are also some other unique um, compounds called beta lanes, which fight cancer um, and also support uh, glutathione production, which helps with the detox in the liver. And, um, you know, the um, athletes have been using beets as well. Um, uh, have people heard about some of the athletes drinking beet juice and stuff? Yeah, some people have heard about that. So, um, yeah, it's been shown that it enhances athletic performance, uh, endurance. Uh, it's not a banned substance, so you can still, they can still have beets. Um, but they are very rich in, you know, uh, a few other vitamins and components as well. So the um, one caution, you know, um, anyone who has um, history of oxalate kidney stones, so beets are very high in oxalates, and uh, um, so that's some, the only reason that you should be mindful about uh, um, beet greens. But without that issue, it's generally a very healthy vegetable that um, people can consume regularly. And often, you know, I hear that people throw away the, the greens when they buy the beetroot, or do they just get the root? But actually, you're missing the most nutritious part of the beet if you just get the root. So um, great food to have to support uh, detoxification. Yes, question? Mm. Um, yeah, so the question is about um, steaming them versus uh, having them raw because of the oxalates. And uh, um, it doesn't uh, change the oxalates too much, but uh, I think that uh, it is, um, you, don't, you don't really lose any of these nutrients by steaming. So you don't, yeah. So it's completely fine to cook them, uh, steam them. As long as it's as long as you're not you know boiling them for hours and you know uh, hours, but um, if you wanted to have them raw in a smoothie and just blend them really well, that's fine too. But steaming or having them raw, it's they're both equally good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's just one food that is great for supporting uh, detoxification, and um, there of course there's many other foods that are great for um, for detoxification support. Um, the cruciferous vegetables, all of those um, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, those are great for the liver as well. And there's many other foods which I talk about that are great for uh, detox support. Okay, and I strongly emphasize spices. So that's another key element of the Paleovedic approach. And um, spices, there was a study from Harvard that looked at uh, nutrient density. And number one was, uh, you know, of all different types of foods, organ meats are the most uh, nutrient dense. And second, actually, uh, is um, spices. So um, there are several key mechanisms that are uh, responsible here. So spices are some of the most antioxidant rich uh, foods that are out there. They're also very powerful anti-inflammatory. So I'm sure you all know, you know, turmeric, ginger, uh, cinnamon, all of these have been widely known now for their anti-inflammatory properties. And um, they're very beneficial for digestion as well. So, you know, the um, microbiome, which is the, the good bacteria in our, our gut, are um, so important for many different aspects of health. And spices actually um, benefit the microbiome. And the way they do that is they're natural anti-bacterial. Um, so they help to get rid of the yeast, get rid of the fun fungus, get rid of the you know, parasites, the, the bad bacteria that are you know, constantly fighting with the good bacteria in our, in our gut. And um, so this really helps the microbiome and this really keeps your digestion in a good, good place. And spices were used to preserve foods, you know, back before they had refrigerators. And uh, so that's why they are so important for digestion. And, uh, um, you know, really, digestion is really the foundation of good health. So um, spices have a huge benefit there. And then they're also very beneficial for um, blood sugar, for metabolism, for um, cholesterol, for, for blood sugar. In a lot of cases, there are... Um, a lot of glycemic and metabolic benefits of spices as well. So 
really, I think, underutilized in the paleo community and uh, um, great uh, to take more advantage of spices and incorporate them in cooking. So if you don't have much experience with spices, um, you know, in my book I have about 50 plus recipes which talk about how to use spices. There's um, um, about um, 13 spices, spices which I call the kitchen pharmacy that are the most, uh, that have the best evidence for uh, medical and therapeutic benefit. So I review all the studies that talk about um, all the healing properties of these spices. Some of them are listed here. And, um, you know, really um, profound positive impact on health. And in Ayurveda, spices are actually considered uh, medicines. So they're in their own category, you know, just like herbs and uh, other supplements. But spices are definitely medicine uh, in Ayurveda. So, yes. Are some spices better fried? So the question was, um, are some spices better fried? And um, the answer is yes. Uh, and that's usually um, known as dry roasting. Um, so in, in Ayurveda, in cooking, a lot of, depending on the spice, but some of them you, you, you do get the benefit by roasting them and uh, releasing a lot of the volatile oils you know, beforehand. And that's how you cook with them. And it actually is it's better that way than when they're raw. So, um, it's true with most of the ones that are like seeds, like cumin and fennel, um, you know, black cumin, um, cloves, those type of things for sure. Yeah, good question. So I'm just going to um, wrap up soon and be interested in taking your, uh, your questions. Um, I want to remind you, this is a picture of my daughter who is uh, eating a pomelo. And um, I just want to remind you that healthy eating should be fun because, um, and you want to use all your senses. And I learn a lot from her every day. Um, her name is Alicia. And um, she just uses all of her senses, you know, the touch, smell, taste, uh, vision. And whenever she's, um, ex whenever she's eating a food, she's really experiencing it, you know, with all of her senses. And Ayurveda really emphasizes that. Um, so remember that you know, eating should be pleasurable, uh, food should be fun, and should be a social thing. So don't forget that element of nutrition with, the, with all the science that we talked about. So I uh, just want to mention, that, you know, I have a, a website, drakhil.com, where I uh, maintain a blog and um, post, you know, I have online courses where you can learn, learn with me. Uh, you can follow me on social media as well, either um, Facebook and Twitter. And, um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have, and thank you so much for your attention tonight. Uh, questions? Hi. Oh, this is Hello? Hello? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, what are the other uses of ashwagandha? And like, what, uh -huh. why would you use it, and how? OK, yeah, that's a. Um, Great question. So, um, so ashwagandha is an herb that's um, used a lot in Ayurveda for balancing the vata dosha. So the, um, that's probably the most powerful herb for balancing the vata dosha in Ayurveda. And uh, it's very powerful for the thyroid. So there actually are case reports of um, um, people who took ashwagandha on their own and then developed hyperthyroidism. So because it was actually stimulating their thyroid you know, so much. So it's the kind of herb is so powerful that you you know you don't want to just take it indefinitely. You want to be um, working with a practitioner. Um, it's very strengthening for the thyroid. Very good for the immune system. So somebody who's very like uh, you know getting sick all the time, uh, very um, um, low depleted. It's also great for fatigue, like chronic fatigue uh, as well. Uh, it's been shown to modulate the um, HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. So it helps lowering cortisol. Um, it, um, it's considered uh, an adaptogen, which is like a class of herbs that helps your body adapt to stress. So anybody under chronic stress, um, you know, uh, modern lifestyle, busy working, um, ashwagandha is great for, you know, keeping in balance. Um, so. Those are probably the main uh, uses of ashwagandha, yeah. Um, uh, regarding spices, um, are specific um, likes and aversions to spices predictive of body types and 
imbalances? Okay, um, that's a great question. So I think the bigger question is, uh, um, are our preferences or cravings or aversions um, you know, accurate or, or useful? And uh, uh, does that pertain to spices? So I think that um, you know, Ayurveda believes that if you are really in balance and in tune with yourself, then you will crave what's beneficial for you. And that would apply in spices as well. So that, uh, you know, for example, um, a um, pitta uh, person would uh, crave certain spices that are not overly heating for the body, like you know, um, cumin or fennel. They're more cooling. Um, but that's not always the case. So that's somebody who's, for people who are totally balanced. But uh, on the other hand, you know, when you're out of balance, sometimes you can crave things that are really bad for you. And uh, you might have an aversion to things that are really good for you. So, <laughs> um, so I think that it, it really depends on the person. If you're you know, in tune with yourself and, and very balanced, then you can trust those aversions or, or cravings. But um, otherwise, you, know, you, you have to keep in mind that sometimes there's a big emotional overlay with food cravings as well. And um, so it may not necessarily be accurate in that case. Hi. It's on. Okay. I'm, I'm a big fan of Ayurveda. Um, I've been to Dr. Lod's clinic uh, every year for the past 10 years for oh, Panchakarma. Um, I, I really love the whole system, and it's very exciting to me that there is a doctor in the Bay Area who's both trained in Western medicine and in Ayurveda. So my question is more about your practice. Are you still affiliated with Sutter Health? Oh, yes. I have, sorry, I forgot to mention. Yeah, I practice at the um, Sutter Institute for Health and Healing in uh, San Francisco. And um, yeah, we have um, several locations in the Bay Area in um, you know, San Francisco, Marin, Santa Rosa, uh, Sacramento. And in our clinic, yeah, we, I see patients. Um, we accept most insurances. And so, yeah, I am. Uh, I don't come down to the South Bay, but I, I do see people in San Francisco. To me, that's very exciting because my present doctor doesn't know anything about Ayurveda, so I end up with all these herbs, and she's going, "Well, what is this?" And I, right, right. so the fact that you are practicing with a group of doctors who are at least open to what you're prescribing for people is a really good thing and very unusual. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Actually, at my um, clinic, it's been uh, for 25 years. We've been doing integrative medicine and. Uh, we're you know, one of the oldest centers for integrative medicine in the US. And uh, um, so, um, yeah, I'm really happy to be there with, it, with everyone else. We all practice together under one roof, um, you know, MDs, acupuncture, Ayurveda, uh, nutrition, psychotherapy, chiropractic, uh, massage. So we're all working together for, you know, for each patient and really enjoy that. Do you take insurance? Yeah, we take insurance. For spices, for spices, how important it is that they be fresh? The commercial ones in bottles, are they really much, or do you have to get a fresh sp spices? Okay, um, good question. So with the spices, generally the, um, um, of course, freshness is very important. And um, the, there's a rough uh, rule of thumb that uh, if you have a um, uh, already ground spice, like a turmeric powder, you know, that um, shelf life is probably three months, It'll be fresh for probably maybe three or four months and should be used up within that time. Um, so ideally, we recommend buying um, spices whole and then grinding them in small batches so that you're not grinding them and then they lose their potency much faster. Um, you can also refrigerate spices that um, makes them last longer. And if you have the whole spices, like for example, whole cloves or um, whole um, fennel seeds, those last longer than the powders once you grind them up. Um, oh, so. the question was uh, how long? So the um, yeah, the whole ones we say six months, and then the the ground or powdered three months is the rule. So I don't cook much. What do you think? Yeah. One night go to an Indian restaurant, the next night to a Thai restaurant, the next night to uh, <laughs> Chinese restaurant, and so forth. Well, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, and also, you know, ha they have these uh, um, pre-made um, pre spice blends as well that you can get online, so you don't really have to know a lot about spices. And even if you um, say, like, 
Do you cook rice ever in a rice cooker? Or No, not really. OK, well, if you did cook rice, you could put turmeric in rice. And that's a great way to you know, get in there when you're cooking rice. Uh, so there, there are simple ways to get it into the diet as well that are not too challenging. Plus, make sure you're writing, eating in the right dosha as well. Right. right. Thank you for your slides. They were beautiful. I'm wondering um, about mental health. Mm -hmm. Do you ever treat patients that have had psychosis or schizophrenia or bipolar? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah, the, the question was about uh, mental illness, and do I treat people with um, history of um, schizophrenia or bipolar or other mood disorders? And uh, um, so the, um, yeah, so the answer is yes, for sure. I think uh, Ayurveda has a lot to offer in the area of mental health. Um, I actually, um, I have um, an online course about Ayurveda and depression that uh, is, um, you can get it through my, my website. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that there's a, a big connection between gut health and you know brain health, the whole gut-brain axis, and that really comes into play with a lot of mental illness. So we really treat the whole bot, the whole person, and um, so that's no exception. Yeah, I still have a question about um, thyroid, uh, oh. TSH. Uh, so basically, um, pituitary gland. Uh, yes. Derex, uh, thyroid, and there's a T4 mm -hmm. and T3, which actually converts to T4. If yeah, I'm T4 not wrong. converts to T3. Oh, T4 yeah. converts to. So, and there was this, um, the spice or what she mentioned. Oh, ashwagandha. Yeah. Ashwagandha. Can you overdo? How do I know I'm hypo or a hyper thyroid? So. Well, the best way is. Uh, um, there are, you know, ideally, of course, a blood test, but you can also do um, basal body temperature. So if you measure your um, temperature uh, at home, just Google, you know, basal body temperature measurement and take some averages of that. Um, depending, if you are consistently very low, that could be a sign of hypothyroidism. If you're um, consistently high, you know, probably not hypothyroid, maybe hyper, maybe something else. But um, the best way to know for sure is to do a blood test through your doctor. Okay, there will be the T4 and T4, uh, T3? Uh, TSH and a T4. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned that um, detox uh, by external sweating is more efficient than by exercising. Can you please explain more about it? Oh, uh, sure, yeah. So um, I think that uh, when the body is heated um, externally, like from a, a sauna or you know something like that, the the way that the, because most of the, many of the toxins that are um, fat soluble are stored in, in fat. And so um, when the body is heated, you know, they sort of like liquefy and dis dissolve. And then with sweating, you can excrete them. And um, the, yeah, so when you're exercising, it does still have some effect in, you know, in detoxification, but you're being heated from the inside. So a lot of these, um, you know, toxins, they're actually stored pretty close to the skin in the subcutaneous fat. So when you're heated from the outside, they sort of more efficiently disperse. Uh, and when you're heated from the inside with exercise, there's, you know, uh, it's a little bit less efficient. But um, exercise has, you know, in, innumerable benefits. So uh, that's not a reason not to do it, but um, to also incorporate the external, <coughs> external heating of the body. Does, med Does Medicare cover what you do? Uh, yes, we take Medicare. Yeah. Does Medicare will cover it? Yeah, Medicare is uh, yeah, accepted. Oh, he had a question. Turn it on. It's muted. Yeah. Hello. There you go. Okay. Are there ways to get any of these uh, seeds of these uh, wild varieties, or they're all oh. gone? So the question was about um, getting um, wild seeds. Yeah. Yes. So these seeds, plants, and. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, there are. Um, there's a, a whole um, group of people online that are, um, you know, uh, selling these. Uh, I think there's a website, I think it's called eatwild.com, where you can um, learn more about these wild varieties. And then if you go to, um, you know, just uh, 
wherever getting seeds from like farmers or the varieties online, you can get more of the wilder, the more rare like heirloom varieties or wilder varieties. Uh, it is possible still, at least as of now, to get them. I don't know about you know ten years from now, but right now it is still possible to. Hi, more about herbs. Three questions. First of all, do you count herbs in your 200 plus foods you should eat um, in a year? Do herbs count as part of the foods that we eat? And can you, do you have to pulse them? You mentioned pulsing. Um, but I thought ashwagandha was an example of an adaptogenic that you did not have to pulse. So I didn't know if Ayurveda had a different feeling. And then can you overdo it? Like basil is a spice. I could eat a whole salad of just basil. Can you overdo spices? Mm -hmm. Or ginger, um, I can just... Yes. Yeah, yeah so the... Um, uh, well, for, yes, you can definitely overdo <laughs> spices. Um, and they can, they, should, they can be counted within that, um, you know, the, the 20 different types of... Because, they're, you know, a lot of them are plant-based foods. Um, so the variety is great. With ashwagandha, um, the... Um, I mean, mainly I, w I want to express caution about that because uh, obviously I'm not working one-on-one -on -one with anybody here, so I don't want to just say take ashwagandha. But uh, if you're working with a practitioner who's supervising you, it's quite safe and uh, can be taken you know, long-term. But there is the risk of um, uh, if somebody is taking it unsupervised, there have been these reports of hyperthyroidism because people uh, didn't realize that it was so powerful for their thyroid that they were being pushed into hyperthyroidism and um, you know getting symptoms from that. So um, you know, the, yeah. Um, so spices. I mean, herbs are not uh, without risk. So I think that uh, having um, you don't need large amounts of, of, of them. I think everyday cooking quantities, spices and herbs. That's the best way to take advantage of them. Okay, break time. Well, let's thank Dr. Akio for his thank talk. You.